Agile is fundamentally about shortening the time it takes to deliver your products to users and to learn from it. Traditional management practices were developed during the Industrial Revolution to manage the work of a largely uneducated workforce. While we can still be somewhat successful when using these traditional management practices, they no longer fit the type of work um, that we are doing in modern organisations. My name is Martin Hinchewood. I'm a professional Scrum trainer with Scrum.org, professional Kanban trainer with Pro Kanban, and I've been a Microsoft MVP in DevOps for the last 14 years. I want to create an understanding of the two different worlds that we're talking about here. So during the Industrial Revolution, we had a largely uneducated workforce. Uh, we needed to make lots of goods really quickly. So we created a model in our organizations where we had the highly knowledgeable people at the top of the organization who were steering and giving direction uh, to all of the rest of the people in the organization that were, were largely uneducated. But the type of work that we were doing, the type of work we were physically doing, was, was complicated. And this complicated work ha had a particular characteristic, right? Um, we could apply more knowledge to it, and it became simple. Right? This work became simple. So by applying more knowledge to this problem, we made it simple. So we created standard operating procedures. We uh, um, built out common ways that things work and optimized, you know, identified the patterns and optimized for them. Uh, we pushed people into ability based uh, groups inside of our organization. So we actually we ended up not only with the hierarchy of our organization, but also the departmental model within our organization as well, where we had the CEO at the top giving direction. They had the absolute knowledge of the entire business and how everything functioned. Um, and they give re direction to perhaps the sales team or the uh, marketing team, right? Um, and they had a, a head who then farmed out that work to individual people down the down the totem um, and work 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 was done and that that works great in a world where uh, the CEO can give instructions give instructions and we follow them and things are successful uh, but the problem is the market is at the bottom and in our new world um, the market is changing a lot more frequently than the CEO is 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 taking a, a, a test on what's going on. So knowledge would have to flow back up this chain and it's too slow. If your organization is unable to respond to change as quickly as your competitors, you're gonna fail. And because the markets have changed, this complicated work no longer really exists. We can't turn it into simple. So every single thing we do becomes custom, which means that that flow of information is becoming heavier and heavier and heavier uh, up and down the chain in order to get things done. And it's just not being successful. And that's because we're, we're not operating in this complicated space anymore. Things have changed. Things have become complex. And no amount of standard operating procedures or processes or practices or ways of doing things can turn complicated work into simple. OK, it, it, it never becomes simple. What complicated, uh, sorry, complex work does do is it generates copious amounts of surprise. Right. That's those markets changing. So we need to be able to adapt to it much more quickly uh, than we were doing before. So that's that's the different world. So traditional. Management and project management practices were developed to work in this space. So you have things like uh, PMI, uh, uh, Prince2, um, more more recently. Uh, we have things like SAFE, the Scaled Agile Framework, um, are all developed to work 
in this space where the work is 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 just merely complicated and we can turn it simple by documenting a process okay but in actual fact we mostly most of the work we do today most of the way our organizations need to operate today is we operate in a complex world complex markets complex work uh, delivering all this complex uh, creative things and agile was a response to that difference right um, Agile's been around a very long time. Uh, the Agile Manifesto was signed in 2001, uh, which is 22 years ago, uh, 21 years ago. Um, Scrum was developed in this space, and Scrum has been around for 25 years. Uh, 2000, 1993 was uh, the first uh, rendition of Scrum. Uh, but even before that, way back in the the new new product development game uh, article, Harvard Business Review article, I have a, a definition at the end, um, was 1986, I think, 1986. So these ideas have been around for an incredibly long time and actually uh, uh, started long before that, but that's, that's too much for, for just now. Um, but if we exist in this complex space, we need processes and practices that were developed for this complex space and uh, we need something a little bit different because um, in our world of of uh, complexity things are very unpredictable okay uh, there's a great lack of predictability in those spaces uh, so here I've categorized the, the types of things that we would do in product development just into three three key areas, uh, requirements, technology, and people. Um, a, they're very broad categories, I do understand that. Um, but let's think about the predictability of each of those items and where it would sit. Well, we're no longer taking orders. right? We're not having orders coming from above in the organization and we just follow it. The customer might say, yes, I want this, uh, but the reality is that the chances of this being what they actually need are, 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 are very different. In fact, there's some good data around that. Uh, so the Standish group in, in Boston create the chaos report, um, and they've added a few things to that story. One of them is that 35% uh, um, of our requirements change over the life of our product. Not only that, but 65% of the things that we build are used little if ever. Think about the waste. For every, every uh, dollar of investment that we have, uh, we're losing 65%. 65 cents on the dollar is being lost just to building stuff that our customers don't actually use. So why do we build things that our customers don't actually use? Surely they asked for them, so they need them. But the reality is that they ask for things they don't need. And the reason they ask for things they don't need is because we ask them an unreasonable question. We say, what are you going to need in a year's time? In 12 months, when we've built your product for you, what do you need? And the reality is they don't know. They don't know what business decisions are going to happen over the next 12 months. They don't know uh, what market changes are going to happen over the next 12 months. They don't know what other unpredictable world events are going to happen over the next 12 months. So their knowledge of what might maybe happen includes a whole bunch of things that they won't need once a decision has been made. Or if a particular event happens, we need these 100 features. If it doesn't happen, we need these other 100 features. And if we're asking them up front, they're going to give us the full 200 features. So there's half of those things we don't need. So requirements, while we like to think that our requirements, once we've signed off on them, are, are fairly high predictability, the reality is, is they're probably closer to that 30% uh, predictable. So we need to figure out um, how do we how do we adapt more quickly to be able to take that into account? Uh, the next thing is technology. Okay, uh, technology could be our uh, uh, the, the the software technology. It could be uh, product technology. It could be um, processes, ways of doing things technology. Right. 
uh, uh, probably Scrum sits in that space, Kanban sits in that space. These are technologies that were developed in order to help us do things. Uh, traditional project management practices, PMI and Prince2 are technologies, right? Ways of doing things. But the reality is that even during the life of a product, the technologies that we need are going to change, okay? So some of those technologies might be uh, uh, would you would you run a product in exactly the same way when you're building something new versus you're supporting something that exists versus something happened in the market that you need to adapt around making a change to what's going on? No, we're going to use different processes and practices. And even in the software technology, Windows and Visual Studio are, 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 are on daily builds. These products, the products that we rely on, that we use as part of our process are constantly constantly changing. Now, technology is probably a little bit more uh, uh, predictable than requirements. Um, I'll put this in the 50% the there. It might be a little bit higher, okay? Uh, but it's still fairly, fairly low. Um, and then our last, our last predictability is people, right? And I don't know about you, but I don't come into work every day and operate at exactly the same level. People are not machines. No matter how much we want to say that people should just come into work and be professional every day, that's not how human beings operate. Uh, people take vacation, uh, people take sick days, people have kids, people have arguments, people have disagreements. If I have to work with somebody I don't like, I'm not going to perform as well as I would uh, uh, if I was working with somebody I did like, right? We're going to collaborate more. What is that impact on, on, on the world? And I would suggest that people are probably the least predictable element here. Um, and if you, if you average this across each of these different ideas, these different topics, we get a, we get a, a kind of picture of very low predictability, definitely less than 50%. Now imagine that you've created a project plan uh, for the next next 12 months. Um, we've created a bunch of mitigating. Uh, we've got we've got a bunch of risks that might happen. We've got maybe 200 risks that might happen over the life of the product, um, and we have a whole bunch of mitigating actions that we've created. If this happens, we'll do this. That. What if 40%? Uh, sorry, a a a. 60% 60 of all of that is going to change over the life of the product and change constantly, right? What is that impact on the body of work that we've created and our look forward into the future? There's a lot of waste in there. Uh, things that we couldn't predict, those surprises are going to happen. So we really want to tackle it in a different way. Uh, so in, in this agile space, we deal with this predictability this lack of predictability, we deal with it by having working product on a regular cadence, okay? So perhaps we have a regular cadence of once a month, we're going to deliver working usable product. So instead of just having that single uh, uh, delivery at the end in our traditional model, we have continuous delivery of new uh, a product, working product that our customer can use, can work with in production, can give us feedback on that will help inform the next piece of work. This gives us a whole bunch of capabilities and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but this is the superpower. Um, this is the thing that allows us to mitigate risk. This is the only thing that allows us to mitigate risk in this complex world where everything's changing so much. We can't plan our way out of the risk like we would in a traditional model when the variance is very small. When the variance is high, we need to create these working usable products because then when something happens, uh, let's say a market change happens, we can maybe do another release very quickly after, right? Uh, we can do more releases than we have here. Perhaps uh, there's a, a world event happens and we need to do a bunch of small releases in order to get these, the, 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 the you know, competitors released uh, new features and we need to get it, our features into market very quickly. Um, these are the tool that we use to mitigate risk. So let's look at what that looks like. 
So in, um, I'm gonna gonna go through this first uh, quickly with uh, with a traditional mindset, right? So in a traditional mindset, let's say we take that uh, a pure traditional mindset where we don't actually give the customer, uh, we don't deploy to production till the end. You got a 12 month project. Let's say it's going to cost 12 million of whatever monies you like, dollars, euros, uh, or pounds. Um, and we're going to deliver on a monthly basis. So we're going to have, um, uh, in a traditional model, uh, we're going to deliver at the end of the 12 months. Okay. So what's the visibility during the life of the product? Well, visibility normally starts high, right? It's going to start high because we're writing the documentation, we're communicating what's going on. Uh, but then right at the end, we've got high visibility because we've delivered them working product. But in between, how much visibility does the customer actually have, right? What can they actually see? What can they use in the product? What do they really know apart from, you know, we tell them things are going great, right? We're 80% there uh, and all of those things. So while visibility is not zero, it is fairly, fairly low throughout the life of the project and goes uh, low fairly quickly. Couple that because visibility is 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 not high, our ability to change also uh, uh, over the life of the project drops fairly quickly. So our ability to change at the end is very low, right? We've built a bunch of stuff, right? So we have low ability to change. It's more expensive to change things, but we drop very quickly after we start work in a traditional model because we start everything, right? We're not creating those vertical slices. This is why things like spiral came into existence to kind of help uh, with those stories. But this idea uh, um, is that the, the change drops off very quickly. We maintain it for some time, but it drops off uh, fairly quickly. And then our customer's operational risk. Operational risk always starts at 100%. What is the risk to the customer? What's the customer's risk? They're looking at us going, what's my risk? Uh, on whether these folks will deliver what I think they're going to deliver, right? So it starts very high, um, and then it's obviously zero at the end because we deliver a working usable product at the end of every project, right? That's That happens every project. Um, but operational risk during the life of the project remains very high. It maybe drops a little bit as they see some of the things we've created. Maybe there's a little dip, maybe there's a little dip there uh, at, at the end as we go into UAT, but the reality is we get to the end and their risk drops to zero only once we've delivered a working usable uh, uh, product for them, once we've solved their business problem. Um, and then if we look at realized value, how much value does the customer have? Well, it starts at zero, they've got no value, and at the end of the product cycle, at the end of the 12 months, they have full value, but during, you know, how often do you actually deliver value to the customer? And I, I very specifically use realized value. UAT does not count as realized value. UAT does not actually solve the customer's problem. It's still a pending problem. So we don't have that value realized until the end of the product cycle. So ho hopefully you you agree or mostly agree with the way I shape these lines. You maybe have little caveats, but I think it's not going to be that much different from, from what I've drawn. So let's take a, a, another look and look at, uh, I'm gonna put agile, but you might call it empirical. It doesn't really matter what word you use. Agile's it's been agile since 2001. Uh, before that, it was just empiricism, right? An empirical process. Um, and what we're going to do is at least every month, at least every 30 days, we're going to have working product and it's going to be in production. OK, um, so where, where does visibility sit? Well, visibility um, sits fairly high throughout the life of the project. Right. So it starts high and then every month we're going to have. I'm not probably not going to put 12 of these little uh, stars in there, right? Uh, but every month they're going to have that same level of visibility. Here are all the things we created over the last month. Please validate that it is what we've created. And during those sessions, you're going to have these 
uh, uh, little little dips where we're not doing anything. I guess I could make that. I guess that could go all the way down here, right? Maybe that kind of makes sense. You know, bring it in line with the 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 that idea of not being able to see anything. But we have all of these touch points. We have twelve touch points throughout the life of the product where the customer is given the ability to to given the ability to change potentially. Also, our ability to change over the life of the product is is very different as well, right? So we're going to start with high ability to change. In both cases, we've built nothing. And then at the end, we're going to potentially have a low ability to change. In both cases, we've built a product, right? So now it's difficult to change because a whole product exists. That was 12 months worth of work versus uh, no work. Uh, but the model is very different because at the end, because we're working in, in, in usable working increments, at the end of each month, when we ship the product, the customer has the option to change anything we've not started. And it has zero impact to our ability to deliver. It has zero impact on the product and there's potentially zero waste. It's close to zero, it's never zero, right? But we have much lower waste when they maintain that ability to change anything we've not started. So what you end up with is you're still going to drop because you're building product, but it's going to be on a, 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 a kind of different trajectory. Right, we're we're reducing our ability to change as we go through the product, but everything we've not built yet still has the ability to change, and we even have the ability to change existing stuff just like we did in our traditional process. Um, but we're adding that to the ability to change everything we've not started. If at the end of sprint four, month four, they want the customer wants to delete our entire product backlog and build a new one, and that's what we work on. That's cool. We can do that because everything we have done so far is usable and works. It's production ready. OK, that's that superpower that we need in order to get there. So how does that look for operational risk? Well, it, it, we're, we're going to start in the same place, right? And end in the same place. That's that that normal model. We're going to start in the same place and end in the same place. But in fact, at the end of the first month, we've alleviated some of the risk. Right? They have some working product. Hopefully, we've solved the most valuable problem we can in the first 30 days. Right? What could we do in 30 days? That's what I do with teams. Is I get them in a room and I say, here's what the customer wants. What is the most valuable thing we could do in this space in the next 30 days? Let's build that. At the end of the 30 days, you've got that. You give it to the customer and say, are, are we going in the right direction? Are we building something that's valuable? Do you want to change your mind? It gives them that visibility. They can potentially, we can potentially ship it to production and they can use it in production. There's all sorts of things we have to do to allow that to happen. But what you end up with is this direct trajectory from top left to bottom right. Right. Every single time we create a usable working product, we we have uh, uh, we alleviate their the customer's operational risk. Right. We also alleviate their fiscal risk. Their money is no longer at risk because they have a working product. And yeah, you might have sprints where uh, you know something bad happens and we we have a little plateau. Right. That's entirely possible. Uh, but mostly you're going to you're hopefully going to be delivering at the end of every every sprint a usable working product that shows progress right um, and then we've got two things we need to talk about for realized value we need to talk about if we are in a traditional organization so a hierarchical departmental model top-down organization and we're we're using agile practices in our team what does that look like for the realization of value realized value is value i have so if you're creating value for me i don't have something that you've documented i don't have something that you've built but not tested i don't have it yet it's not value yet it's potential value right that's great but it's not value for me yet as the customer and um, so right at the beginning we start at the bottom we go to the top and then we have every month we're going to deliver usable working product so every one of these notches is a delivery of value. It's a delivery of it's a delivery of something 
that we can use, that we can get in front of our, 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 our customer, that we can have them kick the tires on, that they can have them tell us that we were wrong or we were right and they'll be able to use it. So that's one option is we're in that traditional organization where we're handed here's 300, yeah, well, let me do that. Here's the 300 requirements that you want us to build and we're gonna build it. But in both of these models, maybe a little bit less in the agile model, we're still under that constraint of, so here we asked for, we were asked for 300 things and we delivered 300 things in both models. But remember, we talked about the 65% that's used little if ever. That's included in those 300 things. So what could we do differently? Well, what would be great is if at the end of the first month, the customer gets the product and they tell us about all of the things that have changed, right? They get to look at the product and decide they want something different. They get to tell us about the way their business has changed in the last uh, uh, 30 days. And perhaps there are a bunch of features up here that they don't need anymore, right? They made a business decision and the world has changed. So they don't need those. So instead, they replace that with something else and we build something else of value. Okay, that's probably too steep. That's too steep. Let's do eh, something else of value. And then at the end of the next month, we build something else of value because they decide they don't need this piece. And then we build something else of value. And perhaps at this point, right, where we're almost at that same value level as we created over here, they decide we're done. We were able to deliver early. We were able to finish the product. This is only possible if we're able to change the requirements. If the requirements are fluid, and in fact, you don't want the full requirements up front, but we want those fluid requirements so we can make changes constantly. And then hopefully, well, that's a bad line. We get somewhere somewhere up here where we have this much higher value product if we continue to build it. It's much more in keeping with what it is that the customer wants. And we've minimized that 65% of features not used. We're still gonna build stuff that's not used and we end up in that space. All of these things are predisposed on having a working, usable product at the end of every iteration, including the first. That is not out with the bounds of every single organization on the planet. It is something that, for example, the Windows team uh, do on a weekly basis. They create a working, usable product on a weekly basis with four and a half thousand software engineers working on a product that is just enormous. If they can do it, we can all do it. The only excuses we have is the existing state of our system, the existing expectation of quality and capability in our teams and in our organizations, okay? We need to work on those and we can all get these capabilities um, and we can all be a little bit more agile. So thanks for um, listening to my little rant. If you are interested in having a, a further chat with me, please use that QR code in the in the top right there to book a free 30 minutes with me. Uh, if you want a free consultation, that's cool. If you want to just have a chat about some of the things I've talked about and how it might be applied in your organization, uh, there's a way to book a coffee on there as well. Just book a coffee. Uh, two books that I really recommend uh, that you read is one is the new new product development game that's a 19 uh, that's the 1986 harvard business review article um, and also stephen denning's book uh, the age of agile those are both great works thank you for listening